What I want to do during this talk is give you some background and information that will help you to lead discussions of Douglas's use of language and image. The image is going to be important, as you'll see, to develop his anti-slavery arguments. And I'll be focusing in particular on how, as a Black man, he used language and image to address white audiences in the North. First, I want to talk a little bit about my experience of teaching Douglas at the University of Maryland. And I think you'll, you'll see why I want to do that. Um, and, and that should be pretty, pretty fast. So I arrived at the University of Maryland in the mid 1980s. So that was a while back. And when I arrived in the mid 1980s from California, having lived for a while in Massachusetts and in, in New York, I was struck by the fact that my students, my undergraduate students, not only had never read Frederick Douglass, but most of them had never heard of him. And this was in the mid 1980s. I was also struck by something else, that University of Maryland is in a black majority county and right near the University of Maryland was a middle school that was called the Roger Taney Middle School. Roger Taney is from Maryland. He was the Supreme, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court before the Civil War. And he was the Supreme Court Justice who ruled in the 1857 Dred Scott case, a very famous uh, Supreme Court case, that Blacks could never be citizens. The Blacks could never be citizens and that Blacks had no rights that whites were bound to respect. But I just couldn't believe it, that there was this middle school named after this person in a Black majority county near the University of Maryland. Uh, that school was renamed in 1993 uh, for Thurgood Marshall. After 1993, I went with my son, who was in elementary school, to the eastern shore of Maryland, where Douglas had been an enslaved person. And the purpose of this field trip, it was a school field trip, was to visit a slave plantation. And I was struck by two things. That the person who gave the tour never called it a slave plantation. He called it a plantation. And the person who gave the tour never referred to slaves. And if we were in person, I'd ask you, what did he call them? And I'll tell you, he called them servants. He said that the servants lived on the plantation. So I, I found all of this kind of amazing. And then I want to move to a more recent controversy that involved Frederick Douglass. I, Talbot County Courthouse is the courthouse in the county where Douglass was born and was an enslaved person. And if you go to the, if you went to the courthouse, starting in 1913, there was a port, there was a statue to the Talbot boys. The Talbot boys were young men who fought for the Confederacy during the Civil War. And Maryland itself was a union state in which 90% of the people who fought in the war fought on the union side. So amazing, uh, there's a statue in Douglas's hometown commemorating the Talbot boys. And if you can see the small print there, the CSA, uh, Confederate States of America, they fought for the Confederate States of America. Around the year 2000, someone proposed having a statue of Frederick Douglass at this courthouse. The controversy that ensued went something like this, that the people who stood by the Talbot boy statue said, okay, you can have a Frederick Douglass statue, but it can't be taller than the statue for the Talbot boys. This controversy began in the year 2000, the statue in the right here of Frederick Douglass was unveiled in 2018. That's a long time uh, before the statue was unveiled. And you can see that the, it's mounted on a, uh, a base that keeps Frederick Douglass shorter, lower than the Talbot boys. Several months ago, the Talbot County uh, Council voted on whether to keep the statue and they voted three to two in favor. So right now, if you go to uh, the courthouse, you'll see both this picture on the left of my screen and uh, to the right of, of my screen of Douglas and the Talbot boys. So my point in saying all this is that uh, when I taught Frederick Douglas at the University of Maryland, and as I still teach Douglas at Maryland, Douglas can make people feel uncomfortable. 
uh, because Douglas is such an anti-racist. And if you feel that there's any sort of racism in the world that you live in, I think rather than seeing Douglas as kind of a cozy canonical figure, it's nice to see him as a challenging figure who even now can make people uncomfortable as they read him. And certainly in that 1980s to the present period, I've seen some, some change, but there's still things going on in Maryland in which Douglas makes people uncomfortable. So what I want to say is, if when you teach what, what to the slave is the 4th of July, Douglas's speech that I'll be eventually focusing on, and finds that it makes people uncomfortable, I think you're doing a good job. Uh, okay, so what I want to do today, having kind of given you this preliminary, is talk a bit about the background that might help you to teach Douglas's narrative, his most famous work published in 1845, but that is not the focus of my talk today. The focus is on what to the slave is the 4th of July, but I think it, it's really interesting to see where Douglas was in the 1840s, uh, the kind of context that might help you to teach the narrative, which I think some of you do teach in high school, and then I'm gonna turn attention to uh, the 1852, that's seven years after the narrative, the 1852, what's in the slave is the 4th of July. So my PowerPoint, I think, will be useful to you because there's a lot of words. I'm not going to read all the words here, but I want to give you a really quick chronology of Douglas's career before the Civil War. I've broken it up into two parts. One part is keyed to thinking about the narrative, and the second part is keyed to thinking about what to the slave is the 4th of July. So to just summarize and highlight, Frederick Douglass, born in 1818, uh, called Frederick Bailey in Talbot County, which is, I've just been talking about, which is in the Eastern shore of Maryland. His owner's brother lived in Baltimore. So Douglass goes back and forth between the Eastern shore and Baltimore, starting in 1826. Baltimore is a huge influence is a huge influence on Douglas because it's there he meets free blacks and there he learns how to read and write. In 1838, when he's 20, he manages to escape from slavery disguised as a sailor. He changes his last name to Douglas. He marries the free black Anna Murray, who he had met in Baltimore, and they make their way to New Bedford. And over the next several years, Douglas works as a cocker uh, in a shipyard, which is what he had done in Baltimore's Fells Point, and also becomes a licensed preacher in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. The key moment in his life, and you could argue for the history of the United States, is 1841, when Douglas extemporaneously speaks at an anti-slavery convention in, in Nantucket. William Lloyd Garrison is there, He's a white abolitionist and a leader of the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society. And he is so taken with Douglas that he hires him as a lecturer for his organization. So that's 1841. For the next four years, Douglas is speaking for William Lloyd Garrison, attacking slavery, attacking racism. And people said, he's so eloquent, this person never could have been a slave. That's one of the reasons that Douglas decides to write and then publishes the narrative of life of Frederick Douglass. And as I note here, it was very popular. It actually was a bestseller. And there was still, uh, there was a fugitive slave law and Douglas was nervous he would be captured and brought back into slavery. So he goes off to the British Isles for a couple of years. Um, Okay, so I wanted to say a couple of things about Douglas's core beliefs as a Garrisonian abolitionist, because he changes some of these beliefs when he starts, um, when he breaks from, from Garrison and when he gives the talk, what to the slave is the 4th of July. So Garrison argued for moral suasion. He was into nonviolence. Uh, that's really important. And Douglas will eventually shift his view on that. Garrison argued that the Constitution is a pro-slavery document. And because of that, Garrison said, do not participate in American politics. The country basically is corrupt. He even went so far on occasion to say, the North should break from the South. 
which Douglas didn't like because that would mean abandoning the slaves. He also, in a very religious way, argued for immediatism, the idea that slavery should just end in a second, it just should be over, uh, which in some ways is consistent with his rejection of politicking, you know, of, of kind of working uh, for elections and, and so on. Uh, okay, so Frederick Douglass, both in his lectures and in the narrative, had to think about how to persuade audiences that consisted of white auditors and readers. And in the 1830s and 1840s, I can tell you, abolitionism was not yet totally accepted. It was seen as radical. It was seen as kind of people distrusted abolitionists, even in the Northeast. So Douglas had his work cut out for him. And he had to figure out how he could move and address these readers and, and listeners who had, you could say, stereotypical views of, of Black people, that Black people were stupid, that Black people were violent. And that was something that was really pervasive. What I have here are passages from two notable Black author texts published before Douglass's 1845 narrative. David Walker, in his appeal to the colored citizens of the, of the United States of America, which he wrote for free Blacks, said very famously, to black people, kill or be killed. And when white people saw this, they were terrified. They thought this is part of black savagery. And in 1831, it was a uh, Nat Turner rebellion and a lot of whites blamed David Walker for that. Henry Highland Garnett at a black convention said to the slaves, uh, a message he wanted to be conveyed to them, let your motto be resistance, resistance, resistance. No oppressed people have ever secured their liberty without resistance. Douglas didn't go that direction or this direction in his writings. He went in a different direction. And again, my focus is on what to the slaves is the 4th of July. So I'm gonna go kind of quickly, but here is the cover page of the 1845 narrative. And I wanna highlight a couple of things about it. First on the right side, an emphasis that it was written by himself, that Douglas read this. Second, I'll point out it was published by the Anti-Slavery Office. That's William Lloyd Garrison, the white abolitionist office. It was published by Garrison. This image I think is really interesting. I'm gonna talk about images over the next few minutes. Douglas used images to present himself as serious. He tends not to be smiling in images or photographs, as civilized, as intelligent looking, uh, you notice there's the tie and the jacket. It's a very formal portrait. This isn't what white people were expecting or thinking that black people look like. And throughout his career, Douglas uses images of, of himself to persuade. Uh, as probably a lot of you know, if you turn to the opening page of the narrative, William Lloyd Garrison writes a preface. And the idea was a white person had to legitimate the text. Uh, Douglas couldn't speak on his own. The preface talks about how Garrison discovered Douglas in 1841. He also says condescendingly about Douglas that quote, uh, with a comparatively small amount of cultivation to make him an to make him an ornament to society, he could become a more persuasive figure. So he saw him as kind of rough and he made that, that kind of insulting claim. So if you were reading this in 1845, you get this cover page, you see the image of Douglas, you would then read the preface by Garrison and there's another preface by another white abolitionist named William uh, Wendell Phillips. And then you would get the opening paragraph of the narrative. And, I, and I'm gonna be really quick here because I, I need to move on. But notice there's nothing here about killing or be killed. Um, there's no anger. It reads almost as if he's like an orphan out of Charles Dickens telling us about how he's been separated from his family. He doesn't know who his mother is. And he tells us from the point of view of a child. And the whole idea here is to get white readers to identify with him as a member of a family, but in this case, a broken family. 
So just to look at an op at the opening, I was born in Takahone near Hillsborough. I have no accurate knowledge of my age, but no anger. I, instead, what he says, I, I do not remember to have ever met a slave who could tell of his birthday. Uh, the white children could tell their ages. I could not tell why I ought to be deprived of the same privilege. So it goes on like that for a while. Uh, again, Douglas working to draw readers in, to sound human as uh, one might sound human when you think about an individual in relation to their family. And again, if you know this text, and when I move kind of quickly here, if you know this text, it eventually moves to a point where Douglas uses violence against a slave master named Covey. And what happens is Douglas is bloodied. He goes to his master. He shows him his bloody body. This is at least halfway into the narrative. The master says, go back to Covey. But there's a sense that Douglas is also showing his bloody body to the reader. And I think that's the point where a lot of people identify with Douglas. Then he fights back against Covey, but it's defensive fighting. Uh, he does not take advantage of the fact that he is able to physically beat up this person. Instead, there is a two hour wrestling match. And after two hours, it's a draw. And and Douglas says, you see how a slave was made a man because he did resist, but it was a self-defensive resistance with no violence and he's temperate and he's not savage and he doesn't hurt the guy. And you know, that is Douglas as a Garrisonian in 1845. I'm now gonna to jump to our focus text and give you a quick part two of a chronology that takes us up to the time when Douglas delivered what to the slave is the 4th of July. So the things I'd highlight here is that Douglas was bought out of slavery in 1847 by his British supporters. He could go back to Maryland and not worry about future slave catchers. He establishes his own anti-slavery newspaper, the North Star. William Lloyd Garrison is furious because he publishes an anti-slavery newspaper called The Liberator. 1850, Douglas gives a couple of speeches, breaking with Garrison. And I'm gonna say more about that in a second because this is important to how one could read the speech. There's a compromise of 1850 that includes a strengthened fugitive slave law, which infuriated Douglas because he thought this made slavery even more national. This fugitive slave law required someone in the North, if a fugitive slave comes to their house or wherever to return that slave south or be put in prison. Uh, 1852, he delivers what to the slave is the 4th of July. 1855, he publishes a second version, expanded version of his autobiography, which includes an abridged version of what to the slave is the 4th of July. And that's what I asked you to look at. And uh, Douglas meets with John Brown and considers participating in the attack at Harper's Ferry. It was very may have helped to start the Civil War, uh, decides it's a suicidal mission. Uh, Brown carries through with it. He's captured, executed. Douglas is seen as a co-conspirator, which he wasn't, but he has to go to England for a while uh, to escape from uh, federal authorities and eventually returns, supports Lincoln for the presidency. After breaking with, with Garrison, two core beliefs that I think are important to thinking about Douglas during this period and even the lecture, what to the slave is the 4th of July. The first is he decides that the constitution is in spirit an anti-slavery document. Therefore he says one should participate in elections and in the larger political process. He also decides that anti-slavery violence in some instances is a proper response to the violence of slavery, which I think is important to what to the slave is the 4th of July, and I'll have more to say about that in a minute. Uh, but it's a, it's a big change from when he was a Garrisonian who's arguing for moral suasion and who is very reluctant to show himself, depict himself as violent in relation to Covey, uh, the slave breaker. I'd also add that during the 1850s, the abolitionists are much more popular. 
there are many more Northern people who are aligned with abolitionists and admire uh, Douglas. And 1852 is the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin, which is the great million seller anti-slavery novel. Here's a picture of Douglas in 1852. Douglas loved photography. He loved daguerreot uh, the daguerreotype technology. I think this is an amazing picture. Uh, again, he looks stern. He looks serious. He looks intellectual. I think if you're teaching Douglas, it's very easy to get these images online and, and to show them in class. And again, dressed with the tie and the jacket, he is civilized. He is no savage black you know, according to the stereotype, uh, even if he does on occasion advocate violence. This is a recent book from Norton that I, I have nothing to do with called Picturing Frederick Douglass in the subtitle, which might be hard for you to read, is an illustrated biography of the 19th century's most photographed American. And it's a Biden that has every known photograph of Douglass. Douglass loved to pose himself because I think he saw photography as making an argument about the humanity of Black people and also the seriousness of Blacks in wanting to contest slavery. Douglas gave the What to the Slave is the Fourth of July speech for the first time in 1852 in Corinthian Hall in Rochester. It was sponsored by uh, an anti-slavery ladies society in Rochester. You had to pay 10 cents or thereabouts to get in. And um, it's about 50 pages. And I decided it's too, it was too long to share with you. Uh, Douglas himself may have, may have thought that it was uh, overly long. And uh, what he did in 1855 is he abridged it for My Bondage and My Freedom, his second autobiography. And this is the cover page. The speech, which he then titles, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, What to the Slave is the Fourth of July, is in the appendix. And what I highlight here is um, it's by Frederick Douglass. He doesn't have to say written by himself. It has an introduction by Dr. James McCoon Smith. James McCoon Smith was a Black activist. So rather than being legitimated by a white anti slavery person, there's a sense, a sense of black community. This person in his introduction celebrates Douglas as a black freedom fighter. It's not published by, uh, by Garrison, it's published by a New York press. And look at that picture. I mean, you don't even have to read the autobiography to get a sense of where Douglas is coming from. Again, he is civilized, he is well-dressed, he's wearing the tie, he looks intelligent, he's well-groomed, and he's holding his hands in kind of fists. This looks like a fighting Frederick Douglass. So this is where the text that I asked you to look at is located. And I'm, I'm going to look at the key passages at the very end of the lecture or essay, but I want to highlight a few things before I get to those final paragraphs. So uh, what is Douglas doing? Um, it, it's very different from these 1840s texts. He is angry. He is working with abolitionists and Klein people who white and black. There were about 600 people when he first gave the speech and uh, they were white, black, male, female. And he's trying to create community in a way you could say through anger. Uh, but there's other things going on. And I think one of the fun things about even looking at the short selection is uh, examining the different tonal modes that Douglas adopts in the essay as a way of making his case against slavery and in a way to make his case for the anger that you see encapsulated in those clenched fists in the frontispiece illustration. Uh, so I'm just going to highlight a couple of things before I go to the most famous passages. The essay, or let's say lecture, begins, fellow citizens. And I just want to highlight that. Uh, citizens, citizenry was vague at the time. Blacks were not formally citizens until the passage of the 14th and 15th Amendments. That's after the Civil War. He is claiming citizenship at a time when Blacks really weren't 
citizens. So it's a bold move at the start. Some blacks were allowed to vote in New York. Blacks could not vote in, you had to have property. Blacks could not vote in Pennsylvania. They could not vote in Connecticut. They could not vote in New Jersey. Um, okay, so um, he starts up by claiming citizenship. Then he talks about the 4th of July and he is angry, he is ironic, he is sarcastic, and he can be kind of sad too. The 4th of July is yours, not mine. You may rejoice, I must mourn, he says early on. Uh, so again, all these different tones, you get the anger, you get the sadness, you get the irony, you get the sarcasm. About three pages in, he, he quotes from Psalm 137, and he refers to the great sin and shame of America. And what I want to emphasize here is that Douglas had been a lay preacher in New Bedford. And at this point in the lecture, he's becoming something like a Jeremiah, kind of prophetic figure, who's looking at the nation and judging it from on high. And again, this is a really bold move for an African-American in the 1850s. But I think that it is an important part of this, of this speech, that he has a kind of prophetic relation to the nation. He's able to judge it, and he invokes the Old Testament. He then offers a series of rhetorical questions. And one of them is, must I undertake to prove that the slave is a man? And there are many others, but it's almost like he's at the point where I don't have to make arguments anymore. We know that black people are human. And then I love this final short passage that I have here because I'm, if you're gonna be talking about craft in your classes, this is Douglas talking about craft. I mean, signaling what he's doing. And he says, at a time like this, scorching irony, not convincing argument is needed. So. This is a lecture that's going to be working in terms of pathos, maybe ethos, but not logos. In other words, um, he doesn't have to make the logical arguments. He can be ironic. He can kind of try to, he can try to get people involved with his own anger. But irony, as he signals, is really central to this text. These are the concluding paragraphs, and these paragraphs that I'm going to ask you to talk about. And I'm tempted to read them, but I don't want to go too far over my time. But I'm going to start out. Uh, what to the American slave is the 4th of July? I answer a day that reveals to him more than all other days in the year the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, then this is a very long denunciation a long de uh, denunciatory sentence. Your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty and unholy license, your national greatness, swelling vanity, and it goes on and on and on. Uh, the paragraph ends, there is not a nation on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of the, these United States at this very hour. And the final paragraph is basically saying, go around the whole world, and you may not find another nation equal to the United States for revolting barbarity and shameless hypocrisy. America reigns without a rival. One of his big themes in, in this is hypocrisy. And I, and I think that's really important. I'm going to emphasize that in my remaining minutes that I can talk about this. So I, what Douglas does in, in this speech, and in the short version, and it's more clear in the longer version, is he is invoking 1776. He can seem like he's attacking the nation, but he is attacking the nation from the perspective of the American revolutionaries. At least that's how he presents things. And he's, and he's attacking the nation as failing to live up to the ideals that are being celebrated on July 4th. And I have this quote here from the opening of the 1852 version because the opening spends some time on the American revolutionaries. And he says about them, they were peacemen, but they preferred revolution to peaceful submission to bondage. They were quiet men, but they did not shrink from agitating against oppression. With them, justice, liberty, and humanity were final, not slavery and oppression. 
And I'd say one other thing about the American Revolutionaries, which is important to this lecture, and also important to a short novel that Douglas published a year later called The Heroic Slave, and that is the American Revolutionaries used violence. They weren't like William Lloyd Garrison. They used violence to overcome oppression. So what he's arguing is that the American Revolutionaries are an inspiration to Black people and to slaves, and he's appropriating them for his purpose. At the same time, uh, there's some problems with the American Revolutionaries. A number of them were slaveholders. And I'm, I, I'm jumping um, to one year later, after he, Douglas gives the speech in 1852, this is the first African-American novel. It's called Clitel or the President's Daughter. It's by William Wells Brown. It was published in London because it was hard to publish uh, for Blacks to publish in the United States, published in 1853, has a quote from the Declaration of Independence. All right, so I'm not sure if you can see that, but it's, we hold these truths to be self-evident and it's, it's all about equality. The president's daughter in this novel is the daughter of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. So the irony and the dynamic of this novel is that Thomas Jefferson, who we've learned about 20 years ago, was the father of slaves, was also the father of freedom. And both of these come together. And I think that's, a, that's an important dynamic in the lecture. It's certainly an important dynamic in this novel. I, okay, I, I'm gonna conclude by just saying a couple of quick things that Frederick Douglass, I um, worked for the election of Lincoln during the Civil War. He went hot and cold on Lincoln, but he met with him twice in the White House and they seem to have become good friends. After the assassination of Lincoln, um, let me back up a bit. After the publication of My Bondage and My Freedom in 1855, Douglas lives for another 40 years. So I'm focusing on one aspect of his career in this talk. Uh, after the Civil War, uh, and this is uh, my moment of narcissism where I show you my book um, that's coming out in the summer, Douglas worked for Blacks to get the rights of citizenship and the right to vote. And that was a huge campaign for him. And even with the vote uh, in citizenship with the 14th and 15th Amendment, uh, there were problems making sure that that was practiced. And, and it was very hard actually for African Americans to vote and do anything actually after 1870. So Douglas remains very committed to black civil, civil rights. This is the cover page of Douglas's last publication. It's called Lessons of the Hour. It came out in 1894. It's, it's a really great lecture and it's Douglas's lecture attacking the practice of lynching. There was an upsurge of lynching in the 1880s and 1890s. And I'm, Again, what I think is really interesting here is that Douglas uses an image of himself on the cover page. Blacks are being lynched because white racists in the South were saying that they were savage beasts who were attacking white women. Here's an image of a, of a black person that doesn't match the stereotype. And I want to conclude with the closing words of the lessons of the hour, because I think this is just so powerful and speaks to us now just as it spoke back then in 1894. So he says, put away your race prejudice, banish the idea that one class must rule over another, recognize the fact that the rights of the humblest citizen are as worthy of protection as those of the highest and your problems will be solved and whatever may be in store for it in the future, whether prosperity or adversity, whether it shall have foes without or foes within, whether there shall be peace or war, based upon the external principles of truth, justice, and humanity, and with no class having any cause of complaint or grievance, your republic will stand and flourish forever. Here is Frederick Douglass in a kind of Martin Luther King mode. Uh, he's not in that angry kind of violent mode of the 1850s, and he should be because of lynching. And he's appealing to cosmopolitan ideals of truth justice and humanity. And he's appealing to the nation to kind of, again, live up to these ideals, which I think you could say are also connected to 1776 and the ideals that he's invoking in What to the Slave is the Fourth of July. 
I have questions of the breakout groups and I'm gonna add a third question. Uh, but the first question is, uh, I think it's kind of, it, it, it might raise questions about people saying this is just so un-American. So I ask about what are good strategies for teaching this essay, especially it's sharp concluding paragraphs. Something I didn't talk about. Why did Douglas give the initial lecture on July 5th? How would emphasizing that date help you to teach Douglas's purpose and craft in this short essay version? And if you don't find those questions interesting, uh, I'm interesting. Uh, I'm interested in what you find as the most as the most dominant or compelling tonal mode of of uh, Douglas's persona of his voice. He is. Uh, he can be. He can be angry and denounce. He can be sad. He can be religious. Um, he could be ironic. So I'd be curious about that. So I'm going to stop.